Hello everyone and welcome to this week's video lecture. Today we're going to be doing some exciting things. Hopefully by this point you've got a full set of drawings, you've plotted a few times, you've got your line weights working well and you're ready to now start layering in some further information into the drawings. We're going to look at two main things today. First is how to create an axonometric, much like this drawing. And the second is how to work with hatches to create materials, to create a sense of depth, to add shadow, to add light, to do all sorts of different things with transparencies as well. So, to get started, jump over to our model space and we want to first look at drawing an axonometric drawing. Now, you may have heard of both an axonometric and an isometric drawing before. This exercise and the requirement of the brief is an axonometric. The difference is that in an axonometric, we just rotate our plan by 45 degrees, something like this. We turn our plan 45 degrees. In a isometric, what happens is, so for example, this is a straight line, the plan actually gets warped out to something more like this, a 30 degree and a 30 degree. And it tends to look a little bit more like a perspective. It looks a little bit strange. The image is warped and it's not quite right. Now, you might use an, oh, sorry, an isometric for diagrammatic purposes. Maybe you're trying to simplify the design down and break it into its pure form, things like that. An axonometric drawing is much more accurate. It's a, it's a real drawing because we've taken the plan, we've turned it by 45 degrees, and then we're taking the height lines from things like our elevations and our sections, and we're constructing an accurate 3D representation of the building. Now, whatever direction you decide to rotate your building will create the final view. Now, I've just rotated my plan up 45 degrees. This was my plan from last week. I've taken it, I've rotated it up 45 degrees, and so the focus of the drawing will be this side. If instead I rotated it the other way, and it was going in X this opposite direction, the focal point would be of the existing house, this part here. Um, as this project mostly is about the extension at the back, I decided to go this way. But it is up to you which way you want to rotate it. You could rotate it all the way around and focus on the rear side. That's totally up to you. So you just might want to consider that before you start your drawing. Which side is most critical? Which side is most interesting? And what one do you want to explore in this particular drawing? Okay, so we've got our 45 degree rotated plan. First thing we need to do is set up our ground lines. Some of you may have a flat site and building just sitting on a slab, that's fine. You can pretty much skip this step, but you want to know how to do it in the future because a whole lot of architecture out there isn't flat, not everywhere it's like Perth. Okay, so I can see on this elevation here, this ground line that I've now selected is very much not flat. So what I want to do is, now that I've created a polyline over that, I'm going to copy it over and I'm going to drag it to that very same corner of the building that we had just here. Right? And I'm going to do the same thing as before. I'm going to rotate it by that same axis point up in 45 degrees. And I now see I have this line. Okay? So if I were to just start drawing exactly where the plan was, the building would get warped and, and wouldn't be the correct height. So we do need to set up our ground lines first. Next one is this opposite angle. So I need the length of this ground line, which we have from this elevation we drew last week. So I grab this ground line, copy it, take it from that same point, edge of the building there, and I'm going to copy it right here. Space to finish the move. Grab it, let's rotate it. I'm going to make sure I'm right on that corner. And let's rotate it by 45 degrees. Perfect. So now see I've got these two ground lines, one going uphill along this facade and one going downhill along that facade. So you can see it's quite a significant drop by the time we get down there. It's about two and a half meters down which is accurate to what we see in this elevation drawing. If it were on a flat slab, it would be something more like this line here, but then we're chopping off half the house and 
we're missing out on all that stuff in the bottom, which isn't accurate. So we need to start with the ground lines. Once you have your ground lines set up, the next part of the process is pretty simple. Really what we do is we take confirmed heights. So let's say, got my ortho on there. I've got a height line of 4685. I'm going to take that, copy it over to this point here. And that's our starting point of the building. I've then got this height over here, UL, going up. You can round it off if you want to. I'm just going to leave it to the scale drawing for now. Take it from that point, and then we can put it on that point because that's the same point of the house. But remember, it needs to match up with where the ground line is. So now we need to take this point here, use the move tool M space, and move it up to that point there where it intersects. And we can now see this is that rear wall of the house. We connect these two lines together, and we now have that rear wall set in place. And the process is the same for the entire axonometric drawing. Everywhere that we have a point in space, like this line here, for example, where just taking it from our elevation or our section, or we can figure it out from imagery that we've got from online as well, which is as effective. Grab that point, come to where that is here in the drawing, which is easier to find um, in the first floor level. I know it to be about here. You would do it more accurately. Drag it up to where it is in the ground line. You can see I've now got that second height there. And you just do this process over and over again until you start having three-dimensional shapes. So if I take this one over here, and we connect the two heights lines together, you can see I now have the corner of the building here. Right? Another useful tool, and of course I'm working on a different layer here, I'm now an AXA, I've created a new layer for this drawing. Another useful tool is actually go ahead and lock everything else that we're working on. So lock, 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 lock. What that'll do is two things. It's going to stop us from doing any damage to our drawings, even though remember we made a copy of this plan at the start anyway, we're not working on the same plan, but just in case. So I'm going to go ahead and lock all of my layers down, and that'll protect me from editing it, but it's also going to turn the opacity down. So now it makes it much easier for me to copy over the top of it. And you can see I've now got the start of a cube forming over here. And once I have a few more vertical lines in space and I start adding these together and I connect the points at the tops, then I end up with something like this. You can see I've got these vertical points They're all coming up with where they correspond from the plan. See these elements here, vertically upwards from this window, they come up there got my garage which comes vertically upwards from this point here. These elements are taken from the first floor plan that I've got which is over here. Where is she going? Ah, there it is. So you can see I've taken an outline of this first floor plan. I've then taken it over to this drawing here rotated it by 45 degrees, and that's then the top of my walls. And you can do that much the same as well. If you don't have a roof plan, this is a, a quick fix. You just want to take the top of your walls, and you can make some assumptions about what happens in the roof. This drawing actually does have a roof plan. So I was able to copy these lines over from the roof, rotate it by 45 degrees, and then pull up the top part, of the roof line because I know that to be the highest point. Move that up by the height which we have from the elevation over here and then just connect the dots to get our diagonal points of the roof line. Right? So it is a, it looks like a complicated drawing but I promise you it's just a simple process of very methodically creating vertical lines from points in space and then connecting the tops of the vertical lines together. You use the plans, you use the elevations, and you use the sections. All of that information culminates together in this axonometric drawing. 
Now we need to see this drawing series as well in your final assignment presentation. We want to see how you've started from your 45 degree plan, set up some construction lines, have your full trace but still over the top of the plan, and then your trace by itself, which then gets layered with hatches, textures, light shadow, all of that stuff, which we'll go through in a second as well. We want to make sure you're not just tracing over an axo you found online, but you actually are setting up the drawing yourself. So please make sure that you do keep your drawings as you go and make copies as you go so that you can show us this series of three, which is a requirement of this submission. Okay, so you may come up to a few sticky points like these arches that we have here. You notice if you try and do a circle, for example, it's in the wrong direction and as much as you try and rotate a circle by 45 degrees, if you watch what happens, it doesn't really help us very much, right? So the easiest trick for an axiometric drawing is to actually design the box that it came in, or draw the box that it came in. So what I've done here is you'll see that plan that's underneath. I've got known heights, which are this point here, and I've just drawn over it again so you can see. So that's the rectangle that I know this arch will form in, or the box that it came in is the metaphor we use. And that, for me, comes from this drawing that I did earlier, this section. So it's the very same thing. Effectively, all I've done is I've created an axonometric version of a box that would do something like this. So drawing over the top, if it lets me do it, let's do a polygon instead. So something like that. So I know my box to be roughly this dimension. If I drew it over the top without these locked layers, I'd be able to draw it accurately. But effectively what I've done is I've taken a box that would be the outline of where this arch sits. I've then copied it over to my axonometric drawing, which is over here. Here we are. And I've made it into a 45 degree axonometric. So you can see that box is shifted upwards here. And then the diagonals catch the two points together. Then all I've done is I've created some arcs to go inside that. So if I move this box down here so you can see what I'm doing. What I've done is I've figured out the center point of the arch. So there we go, that gives me my center point. Then I come up to the arc tool, and remember start and direction is the arc that gives you the most control. This is where we do our arches, our door swings, all of those things. Start and direction, arch, arc, I should say. I start here, I want to finish over here, and then I hold the mouse, my ortho is locked in so it will give me a perfect arc inside that box. I repeat the same steps over here, corner to corner, oops, sorry, and that's what happens when start and direction doesn't work. Cheeky thing. So we come back over here, start in direction, lock that back in. There we go, piece to piece. My author is on, so it will lock in place there. And now I have my nice arch ready to go. So that is the process. Effectively, you draw the box that comes in any time that you can't figure out the geometry or straight lines aren't quite going to do it. If first you draw the box that comes in just like that by outlining it on the plan, using the dimensions you've got from your axonometric, uh, sorry, from your elevations and sections, you'll be able to use arcs or splines or whatever you need to get it happening. I've done the same thing for this pool over here. So this little pool steps down and then I've got this arc. So before I was able to create this arc to get the angle right, all I did was I connected two points in space. So I had one line going this way that I knew was the original geometry. Then I had another line coming this way at 45 degree angle. I've trimmed them both together and then I've just used my fillet tool. Let me trim again. I've just used my fillet tool to get that angle correct. So we can see the pool looks correct. Two steps down and then a nice soft sweep into the pool. So that is the only real trick to axonometric drawings. Projecting heights upwards, which we get from our elevations and our sections. Copying over elements from the plan, 
The offset tool is quite helpful as well if I just wanted to offset this roof line and get this geometry here. And then really we're just connecting the dots. Anything else we can draw the box that it came in and fill in the points there. And you'll find that it's merely a process of methodically putting the drawing together. So this is an important drawing for your set as it'll show your competence and it'll show that you really understand the architecture because while we can see in 2D form what's happening in space, really the crux of the building comes across in a drawing like this. This kind of drawing shows us that you understand what's going on in the building. There's a lot more at play here than we might find in just the planned section or the elevation. So you need to make sure you're spending a significant or an appropriate amount of time on your axonometric to show that you do truly understand the building. And of course you'll be creating a section or a plan that wasn't already cut by the architect to show that you understand the building as well. Alright, let's now talk about the different types of axos you can cut. So what I've taken is what's called a whole view axo. So this shows the entire building cut to the boundaries of its site. So I haven't shown any of the surrounding adjacent buildings or anything like that. I've just shown the whole building. You might also take a cut of your building. So some of you are dealing with gigantic buildings. So instead, you might just take a portion of your building, which would be fine as well. You want to create a drawing that takes up roughly half if, to a whole of your A3 sheet. Something like this, if you come back to our sheet here, you want something that sits kind of like that on your A3 sheet. So if it's getting a little bit too big for your A3, then you are welcome to cut a section and do a section axonometric, which is fine. And we can talk a little bit more about that in class, but it's the same exact process. Instead of drawing the whole thing, you just stop your lines at this wall here and you give us just this model as a part project. Another alternative is to do it as a plan cut axonometric, so you'd only extrude it up to the cut line. Now, this isn't really appropriate for this assignment because it doesn't show us enough of the three-dimensional volume, and we've already seen your plan drawing, so I wouldn't recommend a plan uh, axonometric. You can talk to your tutor about it if you think your particular house is too complex and a sectional axo isn't going to do it, you can talk about it but I would recommend choosing the whole axonometric for most people. It gives you a lot of creative control to show what's going on three-dimensionally and to add lots of shadow texture, etc. All right, so now we want to talk about how to create these bits of texture you see in these elevations, in our section, shadow and light, in our axonometric, lots of play going on there. Okay, so the hatch tool is our best friend when it comes to this particular drawing layering technique. So often you'll find that a hatch like this, lines, will do a lot of things for you. It can illustrate a fence, it can illustrate a garage door, it can talk about color bond roofing, it can be timber flooring, you can do all sorts of things. So you'll find that the diagonal line hatch, which is just part of your hatches you can find here, ANS131 is a very helpful one. Another one is the brick hatch, which you'll find somewhere like this. In our drawing, we zoom out a bit, come over to our section. It's a good one. Okay, so we can see we've got our brick hatches running here running there as well. We've got some different scale brickwork as well. We come over to this elevation. So let's go ahead and turn our raster off so you can see. We've got bricks that are here at one scale and they get a little bit smaller at this scale here. And that really is to add depth to our drawing but also to illustrate a slightly different kind of brick. So this was an existing property and this is an extension. So a little bit of difference in the same hatch can add some depth to that. All of this is done very, very simply through adding hatch uh, with the H command. So let's say we delete this one here. Grab it, delete it, grab it, delete it. Okay. Ah, sorry, my lock 
is still on for my hatches, of course. So that's hatch elevations. Turn that off. There we go, lock. All right, so now I can actually grab that and delete it. So if I type in H and hit space, what it's asking me to do then is pick the internal point. Um, that just means that it needs to be a closed boundary. So you can't have any open polylines. Everything has to be closed off. If you've got a series of poly uh, sorry, a series of lines that have been exploded, you just need to choose all of them and hit J for join and enter, and that will join them back into the polyline. So once you're ready and you've got a closed off box like this, you can pick an internal point. Now most of the time, it will come in as a solid block like this, and you won't be able to see what's going on. So I jump over to hatches, I choose something I want, Let's say I want to play around with this one. So I've now got the line selected, but I have a look at my drawing and I still can't see what's going on there. So just the scale cut. All right, now I can't see any of my horizontal diagonal lines in at the moment. So what I need to do is I need to come up here and adjust the scale. So let's crank that up to 500, what does that do? Yes, we can now see the lines over here, but they're diagonal. So I need to do some more editing. Come over here, I type in 45. Ah, beautiful. Now I've got some horizontal lines, uh, sorry, some vertical lines across here. What if I instead wanted horizontal lines, negative 45? That will give us the opposite effect as well, which is great. Let's say I've already been working on the project and I've got some existing hatches that I just want to copy this hatch over to this one there. What I do is I come to this little eyedropper tool over here called Match Properties and it will match whatever you then select. So you can see that this brickwork now matches this brickwork here. Or if that brickwork, we want to change it again, jump over there, we now get the vertical element. If we want it to look the same as the garage, we can jump over there and grab that. Excellent. The other thing you want to look at when it comes to your hatches is the transparency. So let's say, for example, we're inside our ground floor plan and we've added some hatch to our bathroom here. So let's see what it looks like in the plan. You can see it there. What I've done is I've gone ahead and turned up the transparency, but automatically in your drawing, it'll look something more like this. One more, ah, uh, look like, okay. Once again, turn that back off. All right, so I've unlocked my layout, now I can edit it. So if I bring this all the way down, you can see that it sits really dark and really heavy in the drawing. I now can't see the toilet. I'm struggling to see the outline of the door. I can't see the shower and the screed direction anymore. It's really quite heavy. So in general, you would never leave a transparency all the way down for a hatch. It doesn't matter if it's a shadow, it doesn't matter if it's a floor, whatever it is, a thick wall, you would always turn the transparency up to make it more of a shade of gray like we've got in the pool over here. And that's done in, in your properties box right here. So I tend to have things over 50 for all of my hatches and then I'll play between 50 and 90 for my different hatches. Because there's a lot going on in this geometry and these little hexagonal tiles, I like to go on the higher end and that way it will breathe a little better in the drawing. So I can see now that I've turned that to 71, I can see my door swing, I can see the shower screen direction, I can see the toilet once again. I can turn it down even more if I want to, that's 81, and you can see everything gets even more visible again. Same thing with these floorboards that I've put in this hallway. I've got the transparency all the way up. If I turn that right the way down, we've now all of a sudden got some very heaven, heavy drawing construction lines. Um, so it really does detract from the drawing quite heavily. So you want to make sure that you are experimenting with transparency when you're playing with your hatches. Okay, P space to get out of that. i zoom back out again. I can see that it's having an impact on the drawing, but I can still see all of my line weights are proud of everything else that's going on there.
All right, if we now go over to our elevation, we can have a look at another example of how the transparencies are affecting the drawing. So we can see that there's a lot of depth in this image because we are showing different hatches at different transparency levels. So the brickwork over here is significantly lighter than the new brickwork over here. Uh, and that's significantly lighter again than the shadow which has been placed over the top of this drawing. The same thing is at play over here in this section. So we're using different level of transparency and a different scale of brick over here. And what that does is it gives depth to the drawing. Now remember hatches aren't, actual re aren't actually real bricks or aren't actually real floorboards, whatever it is. You want to be relatively close to the actual scale of the brick, but you can play a little bit with the brick scale in order to give your drawing depth. That's fine. You can do that as well as giving it shades of grey. Let's have another look again. This time we'll go to our axonometric, and I want to look at some ground hatches. So I've got my ground here, which is illustrating grass and illustrating a garden bed up here. It kind of looks a little bit like mulch. A lot of times uh, students fall into the trap of choosing the earth texture when it comes to their drawing. So let's say we've got this one here and I want to change it over to earth, which is this one. Now the earth texture, let me chop it up, something like that, even like that. The earth texture is actually not the correct texture. So this is the texture for when we're cutting a section through, uh, which is fine when we're doing that, but it looks really clunky and awful when it's used over the top of, let's say, an elevation or a section or an axonometric material like grass or a garden bed or anything like that. So you want to be careful to make sure that you're using correct patches for outdoor areas. Now again, those vertical lines that we've just turned on a 45 degree angle here, great for illustrating things like outdoor decking, which we've got over this end of the house, underneath the patio, that's excellent. Um, we can also play around with different depths of shadow. Uh, over here we've got our pool, and so instead of using blue, obviously we're in AutoCAD and we're creating a black and white drawing. What I've done is I've created one layer of transparency, just a solid that I've turned up the transparency on. So if I double click that and show you, it's just a solid hatch, that one there. So again, solid, and then I've turned the transparency right the way down to 60. I've then done that two more times, once at this level, at this step of the pool, and then one more at this dark level you can see there. And so because we've got transparencies overlapping, and layering over the top of each other, you get this really nice effect of depth as we get down into the bottom level of the pool. So that's another thing you can do, and start layering transparencies over the top of each other. Again, stuck in my drawing, piece space to get out of that one. Okay, now we want to look at when we're cutting through sections. So there's a temptation to create, I'm gonna turn all of my locked layers back on now so you can see the full depth of this drawing. Right, there we are. So I've got this nice thick line to illustrate the structure being cut through. Uh, there's depth to my hatches. I've got a solid hatch inside the internal spaces to indicate that it's internal, it's darker inside. I've got some shades of gray giving us depth to the concrete elements, more shade of gray cutting inside the adjacent building over there. So there's lots of depth to the drawing. A common trap for students is to actually put structure inside this sectional element. Um, that really is a tool and technique used for working drawings or construction drawings, not for schematic drawings. So when it comes to schematic drawings, you want to do one of three things. Either leave it white like this, or make it black, so let's say I put a hatch inside there, I make it solid, and then I put the transparency right the way down. I can do that, through space, and so that gives a really nice dark, thick edge, 
Or the third option, of course, is you could give it a shade of grey and do something in between. So I've still got a hard line, line, and then I've got a grey element so I can see where my structure is. Uh, my personal taste is to just have the plain white with a nice hard line, but that really is up to you and up to the architect that you're uh, emulating at this stage as well. What you don't want to do is to create a hatch of something like this. Let's say you want to look at the structure, and so you grab, what have we got here, some brick that might be cut through, something like that, and oh, this, and we see a lot of this sort of stuff, that because it's brick out here, you assume we need to see brick on the inside as well. Not the case. We don't need to see any cut through timber, cut through steel, cut concrete, anything like that at this stage. These are purely schematic drawings. So if in doubt, white, grey or black on the inside of your section cuts. That's all we need to see there. Another thing you can do with your hatches, as you can see in this section, is to actually start to cast shadows and cast light inside the space. So let's take this section for example. We'll come back over to our model space. I'm going to go over here to my section and I'm going to add some shadow into this door frame. So I've already chosen that I've got some western light coming through so I'm going to copy that across. Uh, I've got a 45 coming from there that's going to give me some shadow coming from this mass that's there. And then I'm also going to have some shadow coming on the inside edge of this framework. So let's say I've got something like this coming through at 45, like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make my life easy. I'm just going to take these two shapes out over here and over here. Fill that with hatch. I don't want brickwork, remember, so I'm going to change that over to a solid. I want my shadow to be somewhere around the 55 kind of mark. That's pretty good. Let's enter to the same thing again inside here. Great. Let's move them back in. So I'm going to take this point, pull it back over here. I've got some shadow there, and I'm going to take this one, move it back over here to where it belongs there. Beautiful. Now I'm just going to make sure I delete that line that's there. If I can't grab it, right click center back on the shadow. Now I should be able to grab that line that I put there before. Because remember, shadows don't have edges, they don't have lines that would be visible. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like on our section. Great. So we can see now in our section, we've got this really interesting play of shadow coming down through the architrave. And now it gives the appearance of depth that this door is actually recessed inside this wall. And we can also see that this mass is protruding out from the edge of this face because I've got this shadow line now projecting through there. So you can see that creates a really interesting effect over the top. And now this drawing is really quite deep inside there. The other thing that I've done here is I've projected light into this space. So what I've done is I've created two tones of solid hatch inside here. One for the shadow of the interior space, which is about the same color as these two here, and one slightly lighter in the direction of where the sun angle would be. So I know that this is western sun, so it's going to sit reasonably low in the sky, giving it about 45 degrees. And then I've just projected the line from where the sun would start to enter, down at 45 degrees into the space, and then back out again, created a triangle. Let's do the same thing together here by creating a bit of light coming into this kitchen dining area. So go back over to our model. I'm going to create a line 
from where the sun would come in, because remember the sun's coming from over here and projecting down into that space. Tab to change the angle. And type in 45 degrees. Hit space to finish the line. So I can see that the sun is going to come in down through here, and this little triangle in the bottom is going to be in light. So what I want to do is I want to edit this particular one. Now I could delete it and reinstall a box of shadow inside there, but there's another way around it as well which I want to show you. So if I add a vertex here, I can then move these points in space and it's much much faster than reselecting everything again. So all I did was I hovered over the blue corner Click Add Vertex, and that just gave me another control point to then move that around. Really handy tool. All right, we've got our light. It's going to go inside this triangle. So again, same technique. Just going to do a polyline over where I want that to be. Move it away from the drawing so that it can be solid without any lines intersecting. H for hatch. And then I need to make sure that this one's going to be significantly lighter. So I'm going to move this up to the 80s in there before I move it over. Enter, finish, and then move it back in exactly where it was over here. Now let's have a look. We'll delete these lines. We don't want any lines in there. We'll jump back over to the section. Beautiful. Okay, we can now see this light coming in at the same angle that it is over here. We can have a light entering the space. Got a bit of shadow play over here. Now I think this is probably too dark, so I can come back over here, increase it to about 70, and enter to finish. That looks better. Looking great there. Now, the more you play around with shadow and texture, the more depth you can give your drawing. You'll find that often uh, when we've got a window like this, or any window, you could have two points of shadow. So what I might do is I could have shadow just running along a sliver of this edge by creating an offset or if these bricks were actually sitting proud of the wall I could make a shadow on the outside leaf on the right hand edge over here coming out and then copy it over across to each one of these so there's lots of different techniques and ways of adding depth to your drawing both by casting shadow and by casting light and remember light is the same technique as shadow all we're doing is we're just making a lighter transparency by increasing the transparency over here. This one's at 79, whereas this darker one is at 60, and it makes a huge difference to the drawing. Look how much more depth we have there. This is really sitting out as a big mass now. We've got depth to this architrave in the door, light coming in there. We can do a whole lot more with these windows over here as well, but it's really starting to come together very, very nicely. Okay, let's go P space to get out of that one. Once we've casted some shadows and casted some light and played around with transparency of our hatches, we're getting the drawings to look pretty good. We're kind of at this level, lots of detail going on. We now want to play around with people and trees and different objects to add into the space. So while you can draw your own trees and draw your own people in practice generally what we do is we download some CAD blocks online so I don't expect you to draw them yourself either you can go ahead and download them from online so let's go and have a look at where we can do that now if you just type into Google tree DWG CAD block or free trees block or free trees DWG anything like that you'll find innumerable websites giving away drawings like this and you download the block of trees or for example you download the different people that you want whatever you like uh, and then you open up the file so let's say we've got our trees drawing trees and elevation I've got here yes open it these are all my trees so I need to choose a tree that is appropriate to this house so I've chosen this one here as the most appropriate tree. And it's always good to do a selection of trees, maybe grab a couple so that it doesn't just look stamped in. And then you copy it over to your drawing, you play around with the scale, and you edit the transparency and line weights as well. 
it's always good to have trees as light as possible, so 0.05 and a shade of grey, because you'll find that there's so many leaves together, that, like I've got here, it starts to get really black over the top of the drawing. So you want to be careful when you bring your tree into here, turn it down to 0.05 from the start and shade of grey before you bring it in, and that way you'll avoid this problem as it comes in. The next one is the people. So you want to keep it relevant to your particular case study. So find things that are relevant. Don't just get, I've seen so many times students add nude people walking down the street or all sorts of other random stuff or um, you name it, I've seen it. So just find something that's relevant to what you're doing, download it and then exactly the same process. You copy it over into your drawing make sure the line weights are nice and light and then you bring them in and make sure they're at scale so remember when we bring them in model space they're at one is to one so they should be somewhere around 1700 to 1900 mils tall as a, a an average human size you can scale it as you need to for making shorter people children whatever you're doing that's fine just make sure that they are a relevant scale to architecture. Obviously, we don't want a gigantic human. That's something like this. If I copy this guy over, if we were to scale him and make him 0.2, obviously, that's too small for this house. Same thing if we were to bring him in, but his scale was like that. He's way too big for the house as well. So you want to make sure that it's around about 1700 mils. So if I check this one, yeah, 1800. That is perfectly fine. Adult male inside this building. Then the next thing you want to do is to delete the hatches behind the people. So the way to do that is to, first things first, explode your hatch. So if I've got a hatch like this one here, for example, I can't select any of these individual lines. And you notice that my bricks are a bit wonky and axonometric. That's because they're not particularly designed um, for axonometric view. So just do the best you can to get the angle correct. You can see it's really not looking good over here, but that's fine. For the purposes of illustration, not to worry. You can always do what I've done here as well, which is use the array tool so I've copied this, grab that line, hit Array Path, chosen a line I want it to follow, and then given it a dimension. So I know these bricks are about 86 mil, so that's what I did for this one. But to show you the different lines, I'll choose a different number. If I put in 40 there, it's going to make everything a lot thinner. And then I can delete by trimming all of this extra stuff and then that's going to give me these nice horizontal lines and then you just do the same process again copy these vertical ones over, trim them where they meet and that will give you a rough stack bond so if you've got a curved wall like me like these ones here, you can just give yourself a rough brick shape because no matter how much you play with the angle on a hatch like this when you've got a curved wall or a wall in two directions it's just not going to work so that's another thing you can do as well, a ray tool but back to the hatch over here, if I want to delete some lines out of this, at the moment it's a solid hatch, I can't do anything with it. As always, our friend is the explode tool. So I type in explode, I hit enter. Now I have full control over everything that's going on inside there. I can delete specific lines as I need to. So that's very useful when it comes to inside people. So to make sure I don't have this grass texture going through this person, I've exploded the hatch and then I can delete everything as I want to. Same thing with this person. I've exploded the brick hatch behind here so that I could delete the bricks through the leg. And I went ahead and joined this polyline, the outer edge of their head, with this arch that's inside here so that I could get a shadow line that follows around their body edge. Which really, when we go back to the final drawing, we can see that it really makes it look quite good. So we can see the person, we can see where they're outlined inside there. All right, same thing over here with the floorboards. I've made sure to 
delete any floorboards that were intersecting through that person. So that's it really. What you need to focus on is getting some good people, getting some good trees and keeping it relatively simple. Don't put too many trees in. Obviously you put the amount of trees that there are. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six trees. One, two, three, four, five, six trees. You can see that there. Um, I've taken people and put them in relevant spaces. I might put a few people walking down this street along here or up through the laneway there, that's fine. But just be reasonable with it. Don't put a thousand cars in there. Don't put a uh, hot air balloon. We see a lot. We see a lot of crows and birds flying as well. No, no real need for it. Let the architecture do the talking. So instead of going too crazy with people and blocks, what I want you to focus your attention on instead, let's see this guy here, is just generating a nice clean drawing just like this one with hatches that show control and that are appropriate to the actual materials on the website, uh, sorry, the architect's drawings. You've used different transparencies to create depth. We can see windows. I haven't added shadow or light to this drawing yet, so you could do that too. There's lots of different ways that you can make your drawing your own. And that's really what this assignment is about. It's not just a tracing exercise. You're not just tracing in the plan, the section and the elevation. You're making it your own. You're telling us what the experience is like. I think this building looks like a very nice place to be. And I can see that the project is all about these two courtyards. One's about the pool, one's about the garden, and then the rest of the architecture responds to that. And that's quite clear in this axiometric. And that's what we want from you. What's the concept of your architecture? And how can you make sure that that's evident in your drawing? So what have we done today? We've looked at creating an axonometric by rotating our plan by 45 degrees. You're going to use the known heights in your elevations and sections to give points in space on your axo, then you connect the dots together, leave that over the top of your plan, bring a copy of that over and then start layering in texture. You're playing with line weights, playing with hatches. We also looked at the section, how to create shadow and give depth to your drawings as well. The difference between adding shadow in and adding light it's the same thing, we just play with a different level of transparency and then playing around with scales of transparency to keep depth as well. So you can see that while it's pretty simple, the process of layering these drawings, it does take the drawings to the next level. It does give them a lot of impact when we're looking at them. So take your time, make sure that your drawing is representative of your interpretation of the concepts and of the architecture and uh, enjoy it. All right. Thanks everybody and see you soon.